Today's lecture is going to be women's health, and I have the honor of introducing our speaker for today, Dr. Latanya Hines. She is an accomplished physician who's currently working at Kaiser in West LA. She did her undergraduate um, in psychobi psychobiology uh, at UCLA, and she's a fellow ant eater. She came to UCI Med School, graduated in 1996. Um, she is really excited to be here, and without further ado, uh, Dr. Hines. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. I would like this, it's not a lecture, this is going to be an interactive opportunity, hopefully for everyone, that's the goal, to walk out of here with information that you can use, that you can apply towards the knowledge that you already have, and perhaps you may learn something new. You go to lots of lectures, and even as a physician, you are still in a state of constant learning. So you never stop going to class. So even for those of you who would like to be physicians and you think that once you finally finish sitting in a lecture hall that this will be over, it does not happen. You are constantly given new information with some of the same old diseases you thought you knew. So today's opportunity is about addressing, I put down four, maybe five different vignettes. These are discussions that lead with a topic about a patient. I'd like you to think about every single piece of information listed. I'm just gonna make it brighter. Sure, because all of it has an impact on the ultimate diagnosis. There is no right or wrong answer per se, unless you come up with a disease that we have all never heard of. But there will be an opportunity at all points, you can ask me any questions about the vignettes as we go along for clarification, for information, things you might want to add to the discussion. So without further ado, we're going to get started. Mrs. Jones, 31-year-old, Gravita 2 Para 2. That stands for two pregnancies and two live children. Presents with a last menstrual period. Just assume that this is early January. January 1st of 2013. She feels well, but a bit anxious and overwhelmed at work. I'm sure you guys can understand that with a school that's just beyond intense with trying to keep a GPA of 4.4, right? Is that how all of you are? New onset, vague lower back pain. She has decreased appetite, decreased interest in sex, frequent insomnia, fatigue. Might sound like some of you. Last felt well one year ago after the birth of her son. Are there any questions about what I presented? Okay. Yes. We're going to get to that in just a second, but just with the information, I'm going to go right to the details in just a second. Other question? Okay, here we go. Should just go, right? She's five feet tall. She's 101 pounds, blood pressure is 100 over 70, respiration rate is 18, her temperature is 98.7. Physical examination is unremarkable, meaning that she has no major masses, she's not actively bleeding, she's not coughing, she's not febrile. All her labs are within normal limits, including her thyroid function and autoimmune profile. This is a point where we can really start talking. So what I would like you to see, or actually I'm gonna ask the question, is there anything unique or concerning about her vital signs? Does anybody see anything abnormal about her vital signs? Does anybody see anything normal about her vital signs? Yes. Um, her weight? Her weight? You think she's low? That's impressive. She's well within her normal range. And if we thought about what her calculated body mass index, she would be under 25. So she's not overweight. She's not considered obese with a BMI greater than 30. But I think that's interesting that you say that that's a little lower because the American culture, right, 
we like a little meat on our bones. So someone's five feet tall and we say she weighs 100 pounds, we go, gosh, she's a little thin, right? But upper limits technically is probably about 120, something like that, that that would be more than reasonable and 100 pounds is fine. You could even take that down a little bit, maybe to about 90, 95 before you say, okay, she's getting a bit small. Anybody who weighs less than 100 pounds, depending upon their height, has what we call few reserves. That means that should they become very ill or pregnant, they don't have a whole lot of fat stores. So you have to be careful when you're working with someone who's tiny. Does that make sense? But for her height and her weight, that's quite appropriate. Why did I ask about her thyroid function? Does anybody have a question about why is thyroid function important or how does it apply? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there was a piece of information on the first slide that set the stage for the possibility, maybe, of a hormone malfunction. Do you remember that? Yeah, the fatigue. That was the fatigue. Anybody remember something else about that first part? You want me to go back and show it? That she was? I'm sorry, I can't hear. Decreased interest in sex. That's right. Decreased interest in sex might be associated with a decrease in, do you know what hormone we're talking about? Maybe to some extent. <coughs> estrogen. Estrogen. Absolutely. There's another one too. Testosterone. Absolutely. So decrease in testosterone, perhaps decrease in estrogen, fatigue, hormone imbalance, thyroid dysfunction. But I've said their thyroid function is normal. I said their autoimmune profile, no lupus, no Sjogren's syndrome. Nothing outside of the normal. Anybody got any thoughts about what you think might be going on with Miss Jones? She says she was stressed too. Yes? When did you say her last child was? She said her last child was a year ago. Maybe it's a baby Absolutely. Absolutely. Anybody been around somebody who had a brand new baby? What happens in the first few days of life? It's painful. It is really painful. It is sleep deprivation that is not self-imposed like school. This is someone who purposely just wakes up at all hours of the night, who needs food and attention. That can be very difficult. Part of um, one of my relatives on the East Coast um, is a Marine. And he talks about, or at least he let loose some information, about some of the first stages of interrogating people is depriving them of sleep. And I said, God, that's mean, you know, in the sense of how much I like to sleep. But one of the things about the science of sleep is that when you don't get sleep or restorative sleep, you don't function very well. To the extent that if we deprive you long enough, you can die. I never thought about that. I said, God, you probably feel like you want to die. But the sleep is that important for the brain that if you, with horrible techniques, prevent people from sleeping, they beyond start acting crazy, but they don't function well from a health standpoint. It affects their ability to fight disease and increases the likelihood of illness or worsening of underlying illness. So with this information, next slide. The past history is such that her two sons, ages one and two, were uncomplicated vaginal deliveries. She has no surgical history. Her family history is such that her mother had a nervous breakdown after her divorce at age 32. Her brother is bipolar, type two, and she has a past social history of working as an executive at a bake home loan officer at Wells Fargo. Any thoughts now about what you think might be going on with Ms. Jones? A lot of good information. Yes, sir. Well, there's another predisposition to mental illness. Absolutely. But I don't think that necessarily means that she is mentally ill, but she's just predisposed to it. Yes. There's environmental factors that could trigger it. It might happen, but judging from how she works as an executive uh, at, a late, at a loan officer at Wells Fargo, meaning she's successful and motivated, yeah. I don't think she has any mental illness at the moment. You go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Like that. Next one. We try to hit some of these, but here's where it becomes a little bit more specific about Miss Jones. 
When I said, what do you see, you guys answered that question to some extent. What do you hear and what are your thoughts as a clinician? Everyone in the room has been deputized, if that's a word, as at least a first year resident. I've gotten you all out of med school, okay? You're all bright enough, skilled enough, that's you're done. You are now clinically practicing. Believe it or not, it doesn't take a whole lot more education than third or fourth year undergrad, okay? Just well, so you know that. You will never need the Krebs cycle. Don't ever let people sell you that. <laughs> never need that. You will need it to pass the test, but you will not need it to practice medicine. What I mean by that is that there is a lot of common sense and evidence-based medicine that you will need but you'll see the clinical practicality of it. And you've got enough just with what you guys have said to me that you know what's wrong or what could be wrong with Ms. Jones. So I want to bring up stereotypes. You brought up a very good point. Are there any stereotypes with Ms. Jones that you see? She's an executive. She has two children. She, her mom had uh, mental illness. Anything? Yes. Yeah, what about her marriage life? I'm going to make her married to another executive that works for Yahoo. He wants to work at home, I think. Now they're making them all go to, have to stay at the office now. Um, that's who she's married to. He, too, is about the same age, uh, very successful individual, and they make uh, triple figures or, you know, I don't know. They each are making, I don't know, let's make them make half a million combined. Okay. They're making good money, and they got two kids. I don't know how they did that, but anyway, um, <laughs> it's possible. Other other thoughts for me? Yes. Um, so she's a executive. She's an executive. She explained how she was stressed from work. Yep. She has actually two kids under the age of two. Oh, a husband who's also busy. So that was in their life to be difficult, and it's, I believe it's often known to be. I am with you. I'm going to say or step out on the fact that what she didn't tell you about, and I didn't add, is that after that second child, given that both of her children are under the age of two, did you hear that? Two kids under the age of two, bank executive, basically what I want you to see, she's superwoman. Okay? Wants it all. She is highly educated. She is quite successful on the outside and falling apart on the inside. Looks good on the outside. Got everything together. No one would think that when she pulls up in her, I don't know, 7 Series BMW with her Gucci Pucci whatever on <laughs> and she's got her hair laid to the side, whatever, that she just has it together. I think this is the biggest stereotype about, in general, women, but especially African-American women, that opportunities for women of color perhaps are not as fruitful or plentiful as they might be for others. Let's just put it out there. So when you are successful, not only are you successful, you are exceedingly so. People look at you and say, wow. But you are still just as human as anyone else. If we deprive you of sleep long enough, if we give you more work than the average person could do in a day and, or a week and you get it in a day, something, the veneer is going to crack. What I'm showing you is that someone can present with very real illness and have no abnormality with lab, not be overweight, not be hypertensive, diabetic, none of those things but have risk factors that bring into mind what else might be going on. There is at least a few answers, but where I'm going with this is, is it postpartum depression? Is it a reactive depression associated with just having problems with dealing with day to day? Is it just that she needs a lot of help because she's so sleep deprived that she just can't function? Does that make sense? So this is an easy one. It's not that hard in the sense that I didn't give you abnormal labs, but I gave you a family history that said that potentially she might be predisposed, should say predisposed. So what would you offer her, my young strapping residents? What would you say we would need to do to help this lady? 
This African-American lady, who is the first in her family to be this successful, she's the only one in the family who is married with a husband and children. She's the, everyone else is back in New York, living in Brooklyn, all excited and happy for her, and she's the only college-educated person in the family. She also is the only one making the number of figures numbers she's making, so whenever there is a financial problem, they're calling her and her husband. Some of you can relate to this, or potentially this will be you one day, because you're first generation being successful. Yes? Uh, I'm probably made her aware of all the conditions that she's got, and she's got all the stress, she's got all this stuff on top of her. I'm right. her more aware so she can uh, start her own time kind of managing her stress. Absolutely. Absolutely. I like that approach. It's very comprehensive. It says that there's not just one easy answer, but that we first have to get her to recognize that this is a problem. Because if she thinks that she can continue to function like this, she's not any good for the children. She won't be too good for the loan processes that she's trying to do with the bank. And eventually, she's already starting to affect maybe her relationship with her husband. Remember the decreased interest in sex and fatigue? So whenever she has a little bit of time, she doesn't spend even that, per se, quality time with her husband. Doesn't have to be sex, but just saying she's tired all the time, right? So she gives and gives and she needs some time. So I'm going to say that this patient is presenting with clinical depression. Believe it or not, this is probably the most typical presentation of clinical depression. It is not crying, sobbing, I'm going to kill myself. That's pretty obvious. But or I'm so angry at the world, I'm so frustrated, everything makes me angry, I hate everybody. That too can be a sign of clinical depression. It presents itself with uncontrolled anger or unaddressed issues in that person's life. Yes? I have a question about clinical depression. Yep, so now I'm not a psychiatrist. <laughs> you yes? Said you were talking about clinical depression, but I, the way I would look at it, I thought that clinical depression was if you're basically having depression symptoms with no stressors in your life, but she oh, seems oh. like she had a lot of stressors in her life. I thought clinical depression was mainly like, I'm just getting depressed for no reason. Is no. that incorrect? Incorrect. That I can say, and I'm not a psychiatrist. The true definition when you look at the DSM, I think at this point we're at four or five, is symptoms of what we call anhedonia or decrease in the things that used to cause you pleasure in life, uh, decreased interest in sex, insomnia, whether it's hypersleep, oversleeping, or undersleeping. Those symptoms need to be at least consistent for two weeks. Um, I think you're supposed to be able to recognize it as the patient, but usually somebody else recognizes it. And if you have thoughts or plans for harming yourself or others, that is an issue, right? But you do not have to, as you say, you have no reason to be depressed. Sometimes you think you have no reason, and on the outside it doesn't look like it, but depression is an illness, it is a diagnosis. Just like I wrote diabetes hypertension, we believe that it's associated with a change in the chemical factors in the brain, the neurotransmitters, and for whatever reason, whether it's a reactive depression, your best friend died, your marriage fell apart, you have stressors, two children under age two, increased stress at work, decrease in sleeping, changing your, your job, all those things add together, and your ability to cope, you start to have a difficulty in doing that. Instead of seeking help and trying to do something about it, you internalize, and it starts to present itself like this. Other so, so, I mean, I've had moments in my life where I've been feeling the same symptoms, or like insomnia, like, oh, I'm like, so like burnt out, like all these things we all as students feel. Absolutely. So would we diagnose ourselves? Oh, there's clinical depression quite commonly in college and to some extent significant in medical school. Four people kill themselves in my med school class. It's real. But how you address it is the crux there and looking and seeking help. What did I say? You've got to have two weeks. It might be less if it's DSM four or five. But that, there is a criteria. What I put up there, I didn't tell you two weeks, but this lady has had this going on at least since the baby was born and it's just progressively gotten worse and worse. So all I want to try is to put that out there that the uniqueness of Ms. Jones is that I made her African American. I added a little stereotype that she was superwoman, but that's not unusual. That's important for you to know that women of color, 
and especially to some extent, since I only know per se African-Americans in this sense, that this is a big deal. First generation, going to college, African-American, usually not on a campus filled with African-American everybody, that's not the real world. The real world is quite diverse. The real world has significant expectations of you and don't you fall behind. You start buying into that, you start getting into this. So I put that out there, yes? Because I'm going to go to the next one. <laughs> my stereotype, when I saw this incomes, I mm -hmm. uh, zoomed in on Laura Bakke, and I assumed that maybe she's a cleaning lady. Yeah. With inflexible hours, who has to get up too early, it stresses. Right. Um, but I was clearly wrong. Well, if I make her a bank uh, executive, I got you. But what I wanted is for you to see that depression many times can present with pain. And, but you can't find a specific cause. That's, that's where I was kind of going with that because low back pain is extremely common. Same thing with pelvic pain. Can't find a source for it, but she's hurting. And sometimes that is a physical manifestation of a clinical sign of depression. Okay? Good discussion. Anybody want to say? I'm going to go to the next one. Okay, here we go. Mrs. Williams. I know I'm stereotyping the names. <laughs> there you go. 35 years old, gravity zero, para zero. That means no previous pregnancies, no live children. Last menstrual period, LMP, three months ago, presents with complaints of intermittent vaginal discharge and itching. Recently has unexplained weight loss, increased thirst, increased urinary frequency, going to the bathroom all the time. She denies pelvic pain. She denies nausea, vomiting, fever, or chills. She has been trying to conceive for the past two years. Now, I put this together a few months ago, but I saw that lady literally today. There's no question, except she was 28 instead of 35. What do you see there from just the first line? Anything unusual? Remember I said it's January as far as periods are concerned. <laughs> so she had a period three months ago. Anybody in here think that's unusual? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So the first thing I want you young physicians to tell me, I know you're gonna all say it in mass, if someone is missing a period, what is the first thing you think might be wrong or happening? She's pregnant. Thank you. Thank you. You could be wrong, but the key is I want you to think that first. You'd be surprised at how many times my students will not work with me, okay? <laughs> I pushed the age at this point, given my oldest I've ever delivered spontaneously was 49. I push people to 50. I say if she is 50 with a period, pregnancy test. <laughs> okay, just work with me, okay? The oldest I've ever delivered, it was in vitro, was 52, okay? But that was all coordinated, okay? But that's 52, spontaneous, 49. Oldest spontaneous I had to help with with a little clomid, 47, 47. So don't, be un don't underestimate the possibility of pregnancy in older patients, okay? So three months ago, Absolutely, we're going to think that she's pregnant. However, she's complaining of intermittent vaginal discharge and itching. She has a history of unexplained weight loss, thirst, urinary frequency. What are we thinking? Diabetes. Diabetes. I'm loving it. Why are you thinking diabetes? Increased thirst. Increased thirst. Increased urination. Absolutely. And even the possibly vaginal discharge. Absolutely. I'm loving it. Do you understand, or does someone, someone want to bring up what are some of the underlying, maybe, the mechanisms behind that? Why do they have increased thirst, increased urination, vaginal itching and discharge, missing a period? I'm going to bring it all together in a minute, but does anybody get that? What's, what's where am I going with this? Increased blood sugar is where I'm going. So increased blood sugar, and we call it insulin resistance. And that means that the blood sugar gets released into the bloodstream without the insulin to put it into the cells. When I was in med school, this is interesting, and I never forgot this about diabetes. It is one of the best diseases 
to learn well. If you can understand the mechanism of diabetes and how it affects the organ systems, you can truly, to some extent, diagnose almost anybody's medical problems. Diabetes hits every organ system in the body. It is at the foundation of how we function, which is our energy source. We cannot function without glucose, and therefore we need glucose to survive. Every cell in the body needs a source of energy. If you are no longer able to bring the energy into the system, you will see the system deteriorate. And it affects people from zero, from juvenile diabetes, and even before to gestational diabetes, all the way to the grave. Diabetes is a, I know it sounds crazy, but it's a wonderful disease to follow in the sense of what it does to a patient. And I'm gonna bring up a subset right here with this particular patient. So one thing that I wanna put out there, think about insulin as a key. Think about blood sugar as little doors or whatever, they're in the blood. Insulin is needed in order to open the door to allow the blood sugar into the cell. Does that make sense? So all the cells in the body have a door to allow the energy in, which will be the glucose. But you can't come knocking on the door unless you have the insulin to allow it in. Am I making sense? So if I eat a whole lot of blood, a whole lot of sugar, and let's just say I am a crispy cream queen. So I've got plenty of sugar in my system but it's circulating in my bloodstream and it's not in my cells. Do you see how I'm starving? Do you guys see that? I am starving. My blood sugar is 300, but my cells are not seeing 300 because the insulin, I got a broken key. That's insulin resistance, that's broken. Every time it walks to the door to try to open it, it won't come in. So what happens is if you get some of the doors to open, you can get the blood sugar in, but the patient still does not feel very well. So you'll get a patient that has a blood sugar of 300, and yet they're acting like their blood sugar is 10. And that's where that comes in. But what I want to show you with this lady is that there is a disease. Anybody know what it might be? It's a syndrome. Love it. Polycystic ovarian syndrome. Because it's a syndrome, some people can have a little bit, and others can have the full-blown syndrome. What do I mean by that? It's usually defined by about three different criteria on average. Menstrual irregularity, which leads to infertility. Hirsutism, which is male pattern hair. And maybe obesity, depends on who you read. So here's a lady who's 35, hasn't had a period for three months, complains of vaginal discharge and itching, has unexplained weight loss, increased thirst. So we're thinking she has polycystic ovarian syndrome, probably underlying diabetes that needs to be diagnosed and treated, and she's well on her way to not looking too good when she's got unexplained weight loss, increased thirst. She probably, her blood sugar is probably pretty high. Next. Question? Yes. If she has diabetes, but she also will be feeling like, would she also be having headaches and abilities and also thoughts very well? It's quite possible depending upon where her blood sugar is, right? So if her blood sugar is 500, she might be quite lethargic and not able to concentrate. Well, if she's 500, she's darn near dead. But, you know, I've seen it pretty high. I've seen 400 still talking to me. Um, but she can also look like someone whose blood sugar is 40. It's, you'd be surprised at how 40 can look like 400. Same principle, right? Elevated blood sugar in the serum, in the blood, not in the cell, or the little bit of sugar that's in the cell is only 40. So the body is not functioning very well. But headache and uh, mental confusion, uh, lethargy, you name it, absolutely. Because metabolically, the entire system is being affected, and the main organ that needs to get glucose is the, is the brain. So this patient's definitely not adequately supplying her brain with the nutrition and should not say the nutrition but the energy that it needs so I wouldn't be surprised I could add a lot more symptoms but you are correct yes absolutely 
Now, when you say cause, you have to be careful about the extrapolation there. Causation means this causes that. Predisposition is where I want you to get to, okay? Now, the connection, this is important, the connection between how the ovaries work and how insulin resistance affects the function of the ovaries and why they have mid-truncal obesity, which leads to insulin resistance. And that in and of itself causes a predisposition towards diabetes. It's not exactly worked out with cause and effect. But patients who have severe polycystic ovarian syndrome who present to you with amenorrhea, secondary amenorrhea, they may have had a period once but haven't had one for a long time, mid-section obesity, and there's good studies to show the patients who have adiposity or a huge amount of fat stores in the mid-truncal area are at increased risk for cardiovascular disease and absolutely complications associated with diabetes from insulin resistance. But remember, who looks like that? Men. I'm just saying, right? But I didn't mean truncal obesity. I mean that men have a tendency to have wider shoulders and their fat distribution is different than women. So when you see, a, I don't want to say this, but when you see a woman with polycystic ovarian syndrome, when it's severe, they look kind of like men. I'm serious. Their fat is here, they're much slimmer here, and they're kind of top heavy. Does that make sense? They've got a lot of hair, or sometimes not a lot, but they definitely sometimes can have a lot of acne. The reason is the androgen and the testosterone levels are much higher in these women. And, and their estrogen levels may be normal or slightly low. They're still absolutely women, don't get me wrong. They have a tendency to be a little hairier. So they've got hair in what we call a male pattern. So women, they call it, the, how do you say it? Estuciana, I forgot how to say it. They triangle. <laughs> okay, so the way that the hair grows on a woman is triangle, and yet on a man, straight up, vertical. On these women, grow straight up. They have more hair on the upper thigh, more hair on the butt, sometimes hair on the chest, hair on the nipples, hair on the back. I kid you not. And they have very irregular periods. And the reason is, is because the balance of testosterone and estrogen and progesterone is not there. They're tipping closer towards testosterone and they're androgen heavy on that side versus the way that most women are not. Does that make sense? You start to see a little bit of that tipping in the postmenopausal woman, not in someone who's 35, not usually. Does that make sense? So if you get that combination of male pattern hair, a little more mustache, a little more hair here, top heavy, mid-truncal obesity, predisposing to diabetes, we've got elevation in her blood sugars, although she's not a diabetic, you start thinking, you know what, she might have polycystic ovarian syndrome. The word cystic is not required to have PCOS. You can do diagnostic laparoscopy with a camera, look inside, the ovaries may or may not have the cyst. They usually do. And what that is usually associated with is follicles who, that don't quite mature to the point where you can get a dominant follicle. I'm not going to go there because I get too detailed. But ultimately, why they don't get pregnant? They don't ovulate. Ovulate is release of an egg in preparation for the possibility of pregnancy, that if that egg comes into contact with the sperm, fertilizes it, conceptus and plants inside the uterus, you get a pregnancy. I know all you guys know that. You know the mechanics, okay, that's how it works. So patients who have PCOS don't have that process happening. They can have sex as much as they want. But if the ovaries aren't working appropriately, there's never really an egg there. So they've created to some extent their own birth control pill. They have suppression of the ovulation function, okay? Now, what else do we see? You brought up a very good point. She's five foot two. She weighs 180 pounds. I see your face. <laughs> so there's a difference with that five foot tall lady that was 101 pounds, right? And her BMI is greater than 30. Why did I say that? Was, were, was I trying to point you someplace with BMI greater than 30? Obesity, right. That's the minimum criteria for obesity is the BMI greater than 30, okay? Now, don't get me wrong, nothing is absolute. People can be on that range a bit depending upon whether they're a little over 25, under 25, 30, 31, that's fine. But if she's five foot two and she's 180 pounds, I'm pointing out to you that she's a larger woman. That's what I want you to see. And technically, your BMI is always gonna be greater than 30 to some extent, 
for women because women should never technically be close to or greater than 200 pounds unless they are six foot three. Do the numbers. And there's not a whole lot of women that are six foot three. So if you are six foot three, you can weigh 200 pounds. You can weigh 180. But if you're not, you should be well below that number. Now there's things to take into consideration, culture, whether you're a sumo wrestler, I don't know. But ultimately, when it comes to what we believe to be health concerns associated with the BMI and your height and your weight, women should be, we believe, less than 180 pounds for their average height and weight, okay? So her blood pressure is 142 over 98. What is that? What if I told you I got three separate values on three separate days and that's the average? Diagnosis is? Thank you very much. Do you guys know what the minimum criteria is for hypertension? My young residents? 140 over 90. I appreciate that. Do you know that we now have prehypertension versus hypertension? And where do we want people to be? Do you know the numbers for systole and diastole? 120 over 80. Thank you. And so prehypertension is greater than 120 over 80, but less than 140 over 90. And we meet the criteria at 140 over 90 with at least three separate uh, values at that average over three separate occasions. Some physicians who are very aggressive say, I don't know if I want to wait three times before I start treating you or at least try, first of all, with lifestyle change, try to lose weight, things like that. Can't get to that. Next thing I'm going to do is perhaps put you on medication. Does that make sense? Why is treating hypertension important? Why would it be important in this lady? Yes. Absolutely, absolutely. So it would at least decrease the likelihood for, we think, plaque buildup or what we call that to be atherosclerotic disease. I am a gynecologist, okay? Um, this is like basic medicine, but you are absolutely right in the sense that blood pressure is extremely important with respect to how it affects the vessels in the body. One of the most important vessels in the body is the aorta. You put too much stress on it over time and it can rupture, but more importantly, too much stress increases pressure, intracranial pressure in the brain, increase the risk for stroke and heart attack. That's what elevated uncontrolled blood pressure can do. So all of the treatment to some extent with respect to treating blood pressure is aimed at decreasing, not eliminating, but decreasing that common event, stroke and heart attack. There are some things that might even increase your risk with elevated blood pressure like certain hormones. Is there a hormone that we don't try to give patients who have elevated blood pressure hormone. You're right, that is the base for all hormones in the body is cholesterol. But the hormone I'm thinking about is estrogen. Estrogen, right? I would not write a prescription for birth control in this lady. Okay? Why? She's at increased risk for hypertension, or she has hypertension, but increased risk for stroke. There are some people who would do it, but the goal is, let's see if we can get some of her risk factors controlled. She might be a candidate. I can use an, a progesterone-containing pill, but that's not where she's going, right? She, she wants to be pregnant. Next is, her temperature is normal. She has a mild heart murmur. Lungs are clear to auscultation. She's no masses palpated, obese, mild edema in her ankles, and her pelvic exam is consistent with discharge that's likely yeast. Why does she have yeast? Blood, high blood sugar, I love it, high blood sugar, exactly. Now, I don't understand all the mechanics here, but yeast loves sugar, it appears. And when patients have uncontrolled blood sugar, they seem to have an increased incidence of yeast. Perhaps it's associated with the balance in the vagina. And when you have too much blood sugar, the normal balance of bacteria, a little bit of yeast, all kinds of things in there that keep things unbalanced or imbalanced, get imbalanced. And you start to drive the good bacteria down, you push the yeast, and the next thing you know, you have an overgrowth of yeast. What I want to put out there is that there's no such thing as a clean vagina. Okay, if you wash it out, you have washed out all the good stuff too. So the vagina is a self-cleansing organ. It has a little bit of yeast, it has lots of good bacteria, and I guess, quote unquote, some bad bacteria. There's no such thing technically as bad, except the sexually transmitted diseases, call it that. But ultimately, the key is there is balance, is what I'm getting at. And the vagina is a good reflection of your overall health. 
So patients who get recurrent yeast infections, patients who are susceptible to other STDs, it is a reflection of their overall health. So patients who are HIV positive get way more yeast infections, have a whole lot more increased incidence of HPV positivity on their pap smears, increased risk of cervical cancer. Cervix is also more likely to be more friable or red and tender. So if you put an STD in the vagina in those patients, they're more likely to get it. You guys hear me? So what that means is that not every time someone is sexually active or intimate with somebody who has the disease that they get it. Did you guys hear that? But it is frequency or increased exposure or susceptibility that increases the likelihood that one of those times you're going to get it. Does that make sense? So with this patient, she has polycystic ovarian syndrome. She has lots of risk factors. We've recognized most of them. And now, pretty common. She hasn't been to the doctor in five years. Why do you think she hasn't been to the doctor in five years? I can't hear it. Speak, speak. Health insurance. That's right. You know, this Obamacare, I hope it show up, right? You know, like, I can't afford nothing or, or you know, when I had a job. I, yeah, right? This is not uncommon that people will not go to the doctor many times because they don't see anything wrong. Maybe there are people around them who look just like them who appear, they just tell them there's nothing wrong with you. Does that make sense? So sometimes people can be very distrustful. There is the cultural part I'm trying to get to. That with respect to the healthcare industry, there are people who just believe that doctors, that's when you go to the hospital, you go to die. Do you guys hear me? I know you guys think that's funny, but there are a lot of people who believe if you go to the doctor, you're going to die. Whatever it is you have, they're going to kill you. <laughs> a lot of people believe that. And I'm not going to disagree that sometimes people walk in the hospital and leave a lot worse than when they came in. You know that. But in this situation, she didn't go to the doctor for the past five years because she didn't have health insurance. But I'm going to put out there that she just was distrustful. And the last time that she did go, she didn't like the way the doctor told her that she was fat, that she should lose weight. And that's what would help her to get pregnant. And until you get lose your weight, I don't want to talk to you. And I'm ashamed to say that I do have colleagues that do that. Instead of pre presenting a plan and talking about what her risk factors were, giving her, getting the labs together so she could see where she is, whether she's closer to diabetes, has diabetes, how we can decrease the complications associated with it, put her on a diet plan that can help her, and more importantly, talk with her about how this disease affects her fertility. There's her motivation. She wants to get pregnant. So if you can show her that by addressing the disease, it improves her fertility and gets her closer to having this beautiful baby that she wants, she'd probably be willing to listen to you. Does that make sense? So that approach would work a lot better with this lady than it would by someone just saying, you know, you're just fat and I won't say it like that, but you're overweight and there's really not much I can do to help you. I know you guys have seen that before. Family history, her sister's 13 with type 2 diabetes. Her mother has type 2 and she also has hypertension. That just shows that she has family history, right? Labs real quickly. Hemoglobin A1C is 9. You guys know what that is? Real quickly. It's called glycosylated hemoglobin. It's what you draw and it gives you a feel for what the patient's blood sugar has been for the past three months or so. So whether her blood sugar is good then what she's telling you if this is elevated is that it has not been very well controlled prior to this time. Does that make sense? Normal used to be seven. Now I think we try to get them less than six. Is it six? Yeah. Normal, no, 5.7 is 6.4 is and 6.5 is You ain't playing around. It's tight now, yeah. okay? And that makes sense because if we can keep it low, we know that their predisposition and the complications should be lower. Yes. Oh, like how low? Yeah. Fasting blood sugar. 120, that may not seem like a big number to you. That's huge. Fasting blood sugar when you wake up in the morning should be less than 100. And probably most internal medicine family practitioners like you to be less than 95, probably about 90. People wake up probably about 80 or something. It's not 120. 120 is a cheeseburger. She woke up at 120 and she is not eating in her sleep. <laughs> Okay, so what that's saying is that she has blood sugar control problems. 
her two-hour oral glucose tolerance test, that's where we give you a 75 gram sugar load, more sugar than Coca-Cola. And you drink it, and then two hours later, we say, what's your blood sugar, <coughs> okay? And it should be less than, I believe it's 126. And she's 205. So basically, we have diagnosed our patient with diabetes. And her predisposing factor was polycystic ovarian syndrome as far as her risk profile. She has a strong family history. So we should do what with this patient? What, what would you like to offer her young residents? Yes, sir. I love it. Start on a diet plan. What would you put in her diet? Low carb diet. Okay, I'm going to go with low carb. There's some research to show. I don't know if that's all that effective, but I'm going to go with you there for a moment. Yes. Something that increases the amount of estrogen. Are we assuming that her estrogen is low? I'm getting you there. I'm, I'm going with you. Let me say this. Testosterone, there is more free testosterone in her system in comparison to circulating estrogen and progesterone, the normal ratios. If we could bind the testosterone, meaning that the body would see less of it, the free estrogen would be able to do its job better. Does that make sense? There are ways to do that, but how we do it to some extent and supplement is a birth control pill. Steroid hormone binding globulin, just saying. It increases when you take a birth control pill. It binds to the free testosterone, lowers it in the system. Suppression of ovarian function or whatever it is, it takes over to some extent. Less acne, that's why you get that decreased acne when you take birth control pills. A more predictable, shorter, lighter period because it affects the lining of the uterus and decreases the amount that you shed each month. I like the lights. And more importantly, you have a predictable cycle. Remember, this lady hasn't had a period in three months. Many times these patients will have very unpredictable cycles. Even if they only have two or three cycles a year, they will have huge flow. Sometimes it puts them in the emergency room because they're bleeding so heavily that because of not ovulating that they just have a huge lining. It's just so thick that it just runs out of room. When it runs out, boom, they get a good, big, huge gushes. And they can bleed, bleed down their uh, red cell count very rapidly. Also, one of the things I'll put up just from a gynecological standpoint, it is okay to not have a period if the gynecologist, family practitioner, or internal medicine physician is controlling it. If we put you on a birth control pill that makes your period so light and predictable that you don't have much to bleed from because that's what the birth control pill does, that's okay. If, however, you are like Miss Williams and you haven't had a period for three months, six months, 10 months on your own, that is not okay. The reason is, is because the lining of the uterus can, over time, degenerate and become precancerous, if not cancerous. And the biggest risk factor is obesity, which is a common symptom associated with polycystic ovarian syndrome. Remember that? So obesity, the fat tissue on the body, this is getting real detail, but it can make very weak estrogen. And the weak estrogen, to some extent in high concentrations, can suppress ovarian function even further. Remember I told you the bigger the lady, she's creating her own birth control pill, that's why she's not ovulating? It can get pretty complicated, but ultimately, what do you want to do? You get the reins off of the ovaries. Either you control it or you do something else with the hormones to get it better control. Other questions for me? Shouldn't she be on medication for that? Frank, uh, I'm with you there. What do you want to do? <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's the first step. Like, we should do something. I agree. The diet was good. I would say I just want to add high protein. Give her a little more protein in the diet. And I'd actually add some fat to the diet too. People are so anti-fat. Okay. okay. I'm never going to be size zero. It's all right. But a balance of protein and fat, that kind of diet with complex carbohydrates, vegetables, lean away from the white rice, the white pasta, the french fries, the white bread, high glycemic index, meaning that it brings your blood sugar up so high and then boom, crash. That's where we want to get her away from. 
what you didn't add, and I'm sure you're thinking about that, Mr. Irvine, in your blue shirt, is exercise, right? Muscles do not need insulin to bring the blood sugar in. They're like a sponge. So if you can get her to exercise and change her diet from Krispy Kremes every day to higher protein and add the fat for balance, you will see that this patient will feel better. But polycystic ovarian syndrome patients are extremely difficult because they get so frustrated. They exercise like mad and they will not lose a pound. And they'll do it for a month, two months, three months, and they'll just say, I'm, I'm discouraged. And the reason is the me metabolism. What is driving the syndrome with the insulin resistance and the ability to utilize the blood sugar well? They don't have it as well. <laughs> I love it. You know, it's like you go from one direction to the other. So ultimately, here's a lady that you're going to have to continue to encourage. And with diabetes, remember, when you tell somebody that they're diabetic, many times they believe that that's worse than telling them they have cancer. They believe their world and the way that they've been eating all their life has changed. Just for a moment, just a second, if you guys had to think about, if, if some of you perhaps might be diabetic, but what it's like not to be able to eat what you want to eat when you want to eat it. That whatever your favorite food is, if someone says you can't eat that anymore, it's killing you. It's not easy. And to say, I, I need you to go exercise at least four to five times a week, and I need, that's not easy. So when patients look at you and say, oh my God, the world is crumbling. When you say that these are the things that you're gonna need to incorporate, oh, and that'll help you to get pregnant. She's like, forget this. So I want you to see that in the sense that this syndrome is about 10% of the American population. It's not infrequent. Probably maybe a little bit more common. I read that today, but I think it's higher, but it might just be my hospital. So I put that out there. And her EKG is normal, so we're going to say her heart is normal. And I think to some extent we have discussed it in more detail than necessary. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, case number three. How much time we got? Oh, we're doing okay. Tanisha. I made her very ethnic. Is a 21-year-old, gravita 2. We know that means she's been pregnant two times. Para zero. No live children. Tell me about that first sentence. Last menstrual period, January 10, 2013. You see anything in there? Right. So she's been pregnant twice, but not had a successful pregnancy. And she's only 21. And she's only 21. So what do you think about 21 gravity, two pair of zero? Where are the other two? No. Probably terminated. Probably terminated, maybe miscarried. Absolutely. Why do I bring that up? Not because we want to have that discussion. <laughs> I bring it up because between the ages of 15 and 25 are when patients or people are at their most sexually active. Now I know you can argue with me about this, but from the time that you're in about high school, these are statistics, from high school to about your mid-20s, that's when you're discovering yourself. You are in high school, you are in college, you are graduating, going to grad school, going to med school, you meet the loves of your life, loves of your life, <laughs> and you experiment, you go out and party, you drink, you do all kinds of stuff. The key is that is time to learn, explore, be you, new adult. So if people are going to more than likely get pregnant, not be pregnant, get STDs, the statistics do bear out. 15 to 25 is the most common time where patients have the highest incidence of sexually transmitted disease and also the highest incidence of unwanted pregnancies. It also happens again in the 40s and you'll see an increase in pregnancy terminations because those patients believe, I'm done. I didn't know I could get pregnant and I don't want to be pregnant. Just saying. You see, it's called bimodal distribution. Young and old, okay? And the ones in the middle are doing everything they can to get pregnant. Does that make sense? So this patient is 21 and said, I'm going to the ER with a three-day complaint of pelvic pain, <coughs> progressively worsening in the past 24 hours. The pain is associated with, with nausea, but no vomiting. She has moderate vaginal bleeding and a foul-smelling discharge. Further history includes two, it has new boyfriend for the past two weeks and no use of condoms. Is this common? No? Really? So she's 21 and she had a new boyfriend 
and she's not using condoms. You telling me that that is not common. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna let y'all go with that. But as a gynecologist, <laughs> this is gynecology 101, okay? That condoms are, to me, probably a lot of gynecologists consistent with pregnancy, okay? If that's your form of birth control. Now, I admit, there are people who are awesome about having them on them, in their pocket, wherever they need, they whip them out. <laughs> it is what it is. But most people, during this time, age frame, where they are at their most sexually active, haven't quite learned the maturity, to some extent, about really advocating for themselves. This is a woman's issue, all right? I'm bringing this up. 21 is usually not strong enough, sh sharp enough, bold enough to demand a use of condoms with each and every single act of intercourse and willing to buy them and have them on their person at each and every opportunity that might present itself for sex. Why? There's lots of stereotypes. There's lots of negative imaging about women being quote unquote prepared. I know you hear me. But in order to decrease the incidence of sexually transmitted disease and unintended pregnancy, if we're using condoms, they must be used appropriately, effectively, and often. It got real quiet in here. <laughs> That's how we do it. But most people have found themselves in their lifetime, even the perfect people, in a situation in which they weren't prepared. And yet they still went ahead and did it. So I say that that's normal. I said the right thing to do. I said it's normal. But this lady appears to be paying a price, maybe. So the pain is associated with nausea, but no vomiting, moderate vaginal bleeding, and foul-smelling discharge, and it got worse in the past 24 hours. What do you think is going on? She's in the emergency room, so I'm going to say that the intensity of her pain is pretty serious. Yes. Urinary tract infection, which is not sexually transmitted, but can be sexually associated because of just where the urethra is in the vagina. I got you. STD, absolutely. That's gone untreated, or it depends on which one you get, how quickly it presents itself, versus like chlamydia, you might have it for months before it might present. Yes? I like it. I hadn't thought about that, but that's absolutely true. Is this associated with a recent pregnancy. If I change those dates a bit, yeah. Because remember I said it's January? But if I were to pull it back and say that she hadn't had a period for three months, oh, you'd see where I'm gonna drive you here. Actually, I'd drive you to an ectopic. But next, she's five foot seven. She's 128 pounds. Blood pressure's normal. Temperature's 100.4. Pulse is 110. Surgical history, two DNCs, that means dilation curatage, two terminated pregnancies. OB history, elective terminations. She's taking birth control, orthotricycline low. Her abdomen is extremely tender. Pelvic exam shows foul smelling discharge, cervical motion tenderness. That means when you move the cervix, the patient jumps off the table. It's called a chandelier sign. Some people will do chandelier if you just walk near them in the pelvic exam room, okay? But in this patient, she's presenting to you with evidence of a temperature 100.4 and a pulse is 110. What does that tell you? She has an infection. Excellent. I want you to think like that. Think vital signs first. If you have a change in your vital signs, I want you to believe until otherwise proven that the clinical presentation of the patient is what is driving a change in the vital signs. Does that make sense? Now that may not be true. She may walk around all the time with a temp, with a temp of 100.4. I doubt it. Or she might have a, a heart rate at 110. Some people have thyroid disease, okay? But ultimately, I want you to think that clinical presentation is driving the change in those vital signs. And she has evidence of this side of the room says she has an infection. What kind of infection do you think she has? Some vaginal infection? Okay, very good. There's something up there I threw there because I wanted you to think about it. And this is women in general, not just African-American women. Do you see that orthotricycline low? Orthotricycline low is a birth control pill. And people who have a tendency to use birth control pills use them because they want to prevent pregnancy. But what do they have a tendency not to use? 
Condoms, very good. Why? Why don't they use condoms? Because they don't think they're going to get pregnant. Do birth control pills protect you against sexually transmitted diseases? So by not using a condom, she is increasing her risk for, and she had this new boyfriend for two weeks. <laughs> I told you this is coming. So now they call me down to the ER. Dr. Hines, Tanisha is hurting bad. She has a chandelier sign. She's so sweet. She's writhing in the bed. One of the things that's not there, and you brought it up, one of you, is a negative pregnancy test. But I'm going to tell you it is negative, OK? Because if it were positive, this is an ectopic pregnancy until otherwise proven. Does that make sense? Ectopic pregnancy means a pregnancy that's outside of the uterus. And I'm going to assume that if she's got a temp and she's hurting bad, her heart rate's going up, she's bleeding in the abdomen. I'm changing her vital signs because her heart rate is up and her red cell count is down. Her abdomen is soft and tender because she's becoming a surgical abdomen, and I'm going to need to do perhaps laparoscopic surgery, go in and fix the tube. Probably won't be able to fix this tube. It's ruptured. I'm going to take the tube out, including the pregnancy in it. That's life-threatening. Now, I bring that up, and I think this is so very important. You see that third right there? It says social issues. This is big. And this is specific, I'm going to stand up and say it, about African-American women. I cannot speak for all of us, but I'm going to speak for a lot of us. We don't feel empowered to demand the use of a condom at each and every single act of intercourse. I say that because I see this behavior not in just the 21-year-old who I would cut you some slack. But when I see it in the 40 and 50 year old, I go, what's, what's happening? You've lived long enough and have enough experience to know this. This is not unique per se to African Americans, but there, there is this thought that if you're going to choose to be with an African American male as your partner, the incidence of sexually transmitted disease and every other medical problem that we have in this country is higher in African Americans, next is Hispanic and Latin Americans, and the next is Caucasian and everybody else. Now, that's not anything to be proud of. But those statistics bear out. You name the disease, and I bet you we're at the top of the list. And when I say I, I mean African Americans. That has a lot to do with access to health care. It has everything to do with education opportunity. It has everything to do with knowledge. These things are changing slowly. But that is true. So if we're thinking about who is going to be at increased risk for the complications associated with not having access to health care, with not being able to get the appropriate treatment or delay in treatment, they show up late, it's probably African Americans first on the list. Young people who are not aware that using a birth control pill does not protect you from sexually transmitted diseases, you guys are a very unique population, extremely intelligent, with access to the type of education that many only dream of. That you know more than the average walking American about some of the most basic things in medicine, and you're not all medical students. So that says that when you speak to people, your friends, relatives, family, you are a resource for information. So this patient, Using a birth control pill, wasn't aware she couldn't get an STD, or really wasn't aware or didn't think about that it would happen to her. This is the most common thought, is that young people are bulletproof. It's not going to happen to me. That's why I keep having sex without using protection, because it's not going to happen. And then it does. And then it does again and again and again. So I put this out here to say that the social issues are there in the sense that the 21-year-old has to be empowered to be able to demand for herself that I am going to use a condom if I'm going to be sexually active to protect myself. That I'm willing to be able to demand that each of us in this potential relationship have STD testing before we become intimate. That if you thought about that each and every single person that you had sex with in your lifetime before you married them or not was going to be the father of your child, you probably wouldn't have sex with a lot of people. You probably would not be under the influence when you decided to be sexually active. That's when most of these things happen. 
So I put that out there that here was a common thing in a young, beautiful lady who ended up just having an infection called pelvic inflammatory disease. However, the most common problem associated with pelvic inflammatory disease is subsequent tubal disease. You scar off the tube from the inflammation and infection, which leads to that tube not being able to function well. And over time, should she decide one day to become pregnant, if that's the tube where the egg got released and tries to come down, if it implants in that tube, there goes the ectopic. And now that's a surgical emergency. Now it doesn't have to be. If we catch it early enough, we use a medical treatment now. We use a medicine called methotrexate. The key, though, is that it didn't absolutely have to happen. That's not the only cause of ectopic pregnancies, don't get me wrong, but it is the most common cause of infertility in young African-American women is tubal disease from chlamydia infection and subsequent PID. That's a fact. So what do we do? We try to educate her so that when I hand out the orthotricycline, I hand out the condoms at the same time. I tell her how beautiful she is, how strong she is, how important she is, and that try to make the best decisions that you can, as best you can. And if he doesn't respect you enough to be willing to use the condom, he's also exposing himself as well. Guys don't seem to think that either. Question. How do you convince the patient who believes that their sexual partner may be a virgin, someone who hasn't had sex before? How, you, would you recommend those patients to use a condom in the first place? If they both believe that they're both? They haven't been sexually active before, despite they, they might not be honest with each other. How do I tell my patient, look, I know that. Trust no one. <laughs> <laughs> Serious. Trust no one. Now, if you're a virgin, that means you potentially could expose yourself. If you absolutely believe this of this person, you could still have them tested for STDs, right? And if they come back negative, it doesn't mean they don't have anything, because some things we can't test for except with a lesion, like herpes and things like that. There's some blood tests that tell you about exposure and antibodies, but that's not the same as the actual virus. My thought would be that there is lots of gray room here for judgment, but the point, and I know where you're going, is that safety requires two people, but the way that we change culture, empowering women, letting them know that they can make these decisions and be comfortable and respected for them, that they don't have to bow to peer pressure from this gorgeous guy who says, I am clean because there's no such thing. We talk about the most common sexually transmitted disease is not chlamydia, it's not gonorrhea, it's not HIV, it's not herpes, it's HPV, human papillomavirus, the most common sexually transmitted disease in the population. Between the ages of 15 and 45, three out of four people who've ever been sexually active have been exposed to this virus. Those are old stats. There's 113 different types of that virus. Most pap smears that we run only check for about 10 to 12. There are about at least two of them that we know cause cervical cancer, that's type 16 and 18. It was a German scientist wasn't American, that came up with the causation of HPV and cervical cancer. So cervical cancer is a sexually transmitted disease. It is a virus. It interp, how you say, it gets into the DNA in the cervical tissue, changes the way that the tissue grows and increases the risk for degenerative changes that lead to cervical cancer. Am I making sense? Back in 1940s-ish, Dr. Papa Nicolau came up with a very easy way of assessing the cervix for changes that led to cancer. All he was looking for was cancer. But what he found is that there are stages that the cervix goes through before it becomes cancer. And it was through the pap smear that he was able to see who was at increased risk and who was at lower risk. It wasn't until just recently, within the past 10 years, actually, he got a Nobel laureate in, sci in science for this, that he showed, this German scientist, that it was this virus, the human papillomavirus, that intercalated itself into the DNA, tumor suppressor gene, P53, 
that suppressed DNA synthesis, normal synthesis, and increased the rate for abnormal cell growth. That is absolutely amazing. So we now do pap smears by not just assessing the cells on the pap, but we also check for the presence or absence of the virus. In the presence of the virus with abnormal cells, that patient is at increased risk for precancerous and or cancerous changes on her cervix. If the virus is positive and the cells are negative, she's at increased risk, but the cells haven't changed yet. We watch her a little closer, but we don't necessarily have to do anything to her. Does that make sense? So here is a situation that lends itself from just a young patient, sexually active, that's engaging in activities that probably many of you do. Many of you are sexually active and are at increased risk just statistically. So this is just but information from a woman's side, but more importantly, general population, that no one is immune. And if you're one of those people who say, well, I'm going to save myself until I get married, bless you. Now, hopefully who you saved yourself for is also free of disease. But if they have ever been sexually active, they potentially are a source of the virus. Because it's a virus, the immune system clears itself of that over time. But there are some people with changes to their immune system because they are suppressed. Maybe they have lupus. Maybe they're ill. Maybe they're HIV positive. Maybe they just are having a bad day. And it takes time for the virus to clear itself. We give you about two years. If you still have the virus after two years, as we continue to pap you, then we might offer you treatment. Most of the time, we leave you alone. But that's good information because people think that if it doesn't look like I see anything, he must be OK. And I just want to put that out there that that may not be true. Next and last, Mrs. Smith, 60 years old. Gravity 5, P5, last menstrual period nine years ago, presents with vaginal dryness, painful sexual intercourse, recent onset of recurrent headaches. She says her headaches are 8 out of 10. No nausea, vomiting, fever, chill. Exercises intermittently, works as a head publicist for the William Morris Agency, and manages a superstar. This was my patient. She's 5 foot 8, she weighs 140 pounds, blood pressure 160 over 110. She's been in menopause for nine years, no surgical history. Her mother died of breast cancer at 51. Her sister has high blood pressure. Her brother has end-stage renal disease with a transplant last year at age 40. Social history, no alcohol, eats fast food every day, and loves In-N-Out burgers. Whoa. Right across the street, In-N-Out. What do you guys think about this lady? Anything you might want to... Add, change, you see some risk factors. It's the easy one. Hypertension. Hypertension. Absolutely. Hi hypertension, cardiovascular disease. Do you see her age? Remember that? I said she was 60. Average age of menopause of 51. Diagnosis of menopause is no menstrual period for one year between the ages of about 45 and 55. So she hasn't had a period for at least a year, nine years. She's at least 51 years young. She has horrible headaches with elevated blood pressure and strong family risk factors for complications associated with hypertension. She has some sources of stress in her life with increased managing that superstar. This was J-Lo's uh, publicist. J-Lo is rough, y'all. <laughs> she has three. <laughs> she was killing all of them. Um, and she paid very little health benefits. Hello? Um, so the discussion is, what are you concerned about as a clinician, and what are you thinking? You told me about hypertension. You said that you know, we need to do something because this lady is on her way to some pretty bad complications associated with you know, her elevated blood pressure. What would you do? Stress management. Stress management. What, tell her, yeah, stress management. Should she quit, J-Lo? <laughs> Not right now. You should... should, should Eat better, try to take care of herself. Get more sleep. j got her getting up at 3 o'clock in the morning going to get white flowers for that trailer. I'm not kidding you. <laughs> and they have to be bought at a certain place. I thought that was insane. And yet, she wasn't necessarily paying her a lot of money. You know what I mean? 
I think she was making maybe about $25, $30 an hour. Um, but she got to ride, you know, with J-Lo and Mercedes or whatever. And she was her personal assistant, public, I don't know. I just thought it was insane that people would subject themselves to this. Um, and she was 60. Did you guys see that? <laughs> she wasn't 21. I went, wow. The key, though, is what I want you to pick up on, we'll I'll kind of wrap it up a little faster, is that at 60, and she's menopausal with her headaches, what's her biggest risk factor or the complication associated with uncontrolled hypertension? Stroke. Stroke and heart attack, absolutely. So this is someone that we could talk about diet, but we got to do it in combination. Diet, stress management, all of that. And more importantly, I probably wouldn't just give her diet. I might put her on a little something because I don't know if one of her biggest stressors, which is JLo, is going to change. But it is the way that she responds that there's the stress management. More exercise, trying to find some time for yourself because JLo is not going to change. So you got to change you or quit the job. Yes? Question? I thought I saw the hand up. Okay. All right. So that is our last lady. And here we go. What have we learned? <laughs> Anybody want to take a stab at that just in general, your thoughts when you walk away? Is there anything unique you may have picked up with respect to African American women um, and healthcare and how we address their issues in comparison to just the general population? Anybody want to take a stab at that? Well, I have a question about. Yes. Um, the second case would be. Um, um, STD. Yeah, yeah. African American. You, know you talked about uh, HPV as yep, one yep. of the biggest risk factors. And biggest risk factor for PID? For, no. For having um, sexually transmitted diseases. One of the most common. Oh, absolutely. The most common STD. Not for African Americans. Everybody. 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 <laughs> HPV. But, yeah, and um, because we now have a vaccine, yes. about the gamma and that, it will help. Absolutely. Um, that there are some places where it's still not cool to get the vaccine. Absolutely. And I'm wondering if that uncoolness is more common in African American families than others. So maybe Interesting. I would, I would step out, I have no evidence behind this, that there is probably more distrust and the, the right. combination of distrust of the healthcare industry per se as a group culturally. You'll see that in African Americans, absolutely. I bring up, you guys probably are aware of the Tuskegee experiment, um, but there are several incidences of medical horribleness, I can't think of a better word, with respect to people of color. Um, that's African Americans, the Tuskegee experiment. There's a lot that happened at Johns Hopkins University. Um, you know, you guys talk about the um, Gila, Henrietta, oh my God, you guys should read that book. Um, of course, as a gynecologist, I had to read it. And I was just, oh, Lord. Amazing what happened with respect to the HeLa cells. But on the same hand, how they got it and what their thought process was behind it is not unique to that time and era. Recently, and I say recent in the sense of the late 60s, early 70s, we were sterilizing people at good old USC, mostly Hispanic women unbeknownst to them because the physicians felt they didn't need to have any more kids. So they were either doing tubal ligations without their consent or placing IUDs and they were unaware of it. Yes, in this country, in this state. So there are many incidences, I could name more, but there is at least room to consider that for people of color, distrust of the healthcare industry is warranted. Now you and I, and probably most people in this room, have perhaps not had such a negative experience. Maybe, maybe not. But that's different than the times not too long ago. So vaccines, especially with the newer movement, I call it the granola movement. And that is, I know I'm like, nothing for the baby. Don't give the baby this, don't give the baby that. We are gonna live with alfalfa. All right. <laughs> The reason why that the incidence of polio, the incidence of measles, mumps, rubella, diphtheria, you name it, is because of pioneers in medicine who came up with vaccines 
and were able to inoculate all of us, most of us, so that we would not get these diseases. Most of us don't know anything about because the incidence is so low or almost zero. But there is a epidemic of diphtheria and whooping cough, a disease that most people have probably never heard of because there was such a movement. We don't want vaccines. Now, you can do that because of what we call herd immunity. That means there's enough people in this room, enough people in this city, in this state that have been vaccinated that even if you haven't, you've got enough people around you that probably will not get it. But if you take enough small children, you put them in grade school, and you get a group of them in Santa Monica and say, we want no vaccine, send one of them out of the country and get measles and bring them back, what do you think happened? You see, vaccines are real. So when I hear that, I go, oh my God, measles is no joke. And for that matter, neither is chicken pox. We don't think too much about these diseases, but they are very real and they kill people. So that kind of thought that, well, I don't want the vaccine for HPV. It hasn't been out long enough. It's been tested at least 10 years. And you're right, we don't, have, we don't know as much about HPV vaccine as we know about the chicken pox, not chicken pox, let's do measles, mumps, rubella. The key though is that the studies for 10 years were randomized double blind studies. Some people got the vaccine, some people didn't. So we feel like we could at least do enough evidence-based research to say that it absolutely does decrease the incidence of cervical cancer. It doesn't eliminate it because there are 113 different types of that virus that we know of, probably more. The vaccine, depends on the one you get, only covers either four types, 6, 11, 16, and 18, or just 16 and 18, which are the cancer-causing ones, we think. So the key is that the vaccine is for a generation that hopefully in the next 10 to 20 years will never get a cervical cancer. It is possible to get the vaccine, three of them, three vaccines you get, that could lead you to get potentially exposed to another type of HPV, and you might get an abnormal pap. But nobody yet who's gotten that vaccine has gotten a cervical cancer. And that is amazing. Okay? Questions? Thoughts? Yes? Sorry, earlier you were talking about how estrogen, essentially the levels of estrogen are lowered through the use of birth control. Absolutely. Estrogen suppresses, well, estro birth control pills. Here we go. Let's start. This is like I talk to my patients for a second. The brain sends a signal to the ovaries. The signal is called FSH, follicle stimulating hormone. Follicle, think ovary. That stimulating hormone tells the ovary to release estrogen and function appropriately to produce the process of ovulation. The ovary sends back a signal, negative and positive feedback, mm -hmm. that says, oh, I got enough estrogen I'm producing. I'm cool right now downgrade the amount of estrogen we need right now. So there's a normal kind of circulating amount of estrogen in the system. It rises and falls depending upon where you are in your menstrual cycle. Am I making sense? All right. In pregnancy, the rise and fall of estrogen changes, including progesterone. It rises in anticipation, the estrogen and progesterone, as you get closer and closer towards mid-cycle. That's in anticipation of pregnancy and ovulation. If you do not get pregnant, this is a natural cycle. The estrogen levels eventually will fall, and so will the progesterone levels, and they get to a certain level when they get low enough that is a trigger to shed the lining of the uterus. It is no longer needed. Does that make sense? But the process of preparing the lining, meaning from first day of period bleeding to the first day of the next period, the uterus is doing everything it can to prepare for the possibility of pregnancy. If it does not happen, Hormone levels fall, shed the lining. And even before you finish shedding the lining, it's on its way to doing it again. If you take a birth control pill, remember the signals from the brain to the ovary? You are taking estrogen. The brain says, oh, there's more estrogen in the system. Shut down ovary. I don't need you to produce estrogen because you are already giving it to me. If you take it every day as you're supposed to at approximately the same time, the levels rise, and they fall just a bit to this level. Let's call this 8 o'clock in the morning. 8 o'clock in the morning to 8 o'clock in the morning the next day. 8 o'clock in the morning to 8 o'clock. But it's Friday night. Boom! I forgot to take my pill the next day. I went over to my boyfriend's house. Oh, man! I forgot to bring the pills with me. It's Saturday. Do you see the levels down here? 
Now on Monday, you're back in your dorm room. You're like, oh, I got to take my pill. I missed two, two days worth of pill, but I used a condom. The levels are so low that even if you take two pills, three pills, <laughs> to try to get the concentration back up, more than likely in a young person, you have lost the beneficial effect to some extent of protection from pregnancy for that cycle. Now, I still want you to take the pill because when you drop the level, what happens when we drop levels? Period. Remember that? So if you stop taking your pill or you start doing it irregularly, what happens is you get irregular bleeding. You causing that. You not taking the pill appropriately. So taking the pill consistently keeps the levels in the system the same. What do the levels the same look like? Pregnancy. People who are pregnant have a baseline level of estrogen that's slightly higher than when they are not pregnant, but not sky high. And then after you have the baby, believe it or not, the estrogen levels fall, and that's how you make milk. And when you decide that you no longer want to breastfeed, what happens is the levels start to rise again, and you have a period. And usually around the time that you're having your period is when your milk's drying up. Depends on what you want to do. But is it possible to get pregnant and breastfeed? Absolutely. But most of the time, while you're breastfeeding, the hormone status necessary to breastfeed keeps you from having regular periods or no period. And as you start to breastfeed less, hormone levels come up off the ovaries and you're able to have a period. Yes, this is complicated, don't get me wrong. And there's no question that that cycle associated with, you brought it up, cholesterol, and how cholesterol makes progesterone and makes estrogen and testosterone, that's no joke. It is difficult. But you will need that. You will need to understand that. But not all the details. Yes. yes. Are there any um, malicious side effects, permanent side effects, taking birth control? Permanent side effects? Yeah, I guess if you smoke and you have a stroke. Yeah. It does estrogen, increased estrogen in the system, does cause what we, we call hypercoagulability. Some people are more susceptible than others. We don't know who. Some people have what we call factor five Leiden issues and they have an increased risk of clotting. And that means that if you give them estrogen, they're at increased risk for having a clot in the lower extremity or in the lung. So when you read the package insert, excuse me, pulmonary embolism, heart attack, stroke, has been shown to be associated. Um, there does not appear to be any significant evidence-based medicine associated with birth control pills and breast cancer, but absolutely increased risk of breast cancer with hormone replacement therapy. Yes, it's still estrogen and progesterone, but it's estrogen and progesterone in the postmenopausal woman versus estrogen and progesterone in much higher doses in the premenopausal woman. It's very detailed we could get into. You, wait. Gotta give other people questions. Yes. Any risk of your fertility off? No. Birth control pills, there's good studies to show that when you're on a birth control pill, it only works as long as you take it. For those who have been on birth control pills and miss a day, miss a couple days, those who have been pregnant unintentionally, you know how the birth control pill works. It only works as long as you take it. It is out of the system in less than 24 hours. That's why you keep taking it every day. Depending upon the dose that I give you, whether you get a micro dose of 20 versus a 30 or 35 microgram pill, you might get a little bit more leeway on an ortho tricycline. But an ortho tricycline low, you don't have much leeway. Miss that pill and the likelihood of pregnancy is a lot higher than if you miss a day of ortho tricycline. I don't recommend it, but the higher the dose, you get a little more grace because it stays in the system a little longer, a little bit more medicine in the system. Is there permanent? No. What I want to bring up, and this is really common, patients will go on the birth control pill in their early 20s. They're in college. They're wonderful people. They get a job. Life is good. But the reason they went on the birth control pill is because they had irregular cycles. They forgot about that because their cycles come like clockwork as long as they take that birth control pill. And life is good. Their cycles are short, light, perfect. They meet Mr. Wright at 29. Oh, he's great. We got to get married. Let's have some kids. They go off of the birth control pill and they haven't had a cycle in three months. It's the pill, Dr. Hines. The birth control pill is out of the cycle in less, out of the like body in less than 24 hours. What are you seeing? The return of your normal cycle. That's your cycle. Wait long enough and get into, what is it? Max uh, peak fertility is age 24. Get down to 35, 36, 37. What's happening? Age has a huge impact on fertility. It's not that birth control pill. 
it's you being 37. So it's important for patients to understand that the birth control pill does not have a permanent effect on your ovary. You can see by, that by just stop taking it. Also, when we talked about that, if you take it and your period goes away, it goes away because you're taking the pill. You want your period to come back? Stop taking the pill. And some patients go, but well, Dr. Hines, I stopped taking that pill for three or four months and my period hasn't come back. Was your period irregular before you got on the birth control pill? Does that make sense? So sometimes I have to supplement them with progesterone or other hormones to try to get their cycle back, which tells me the, one, the hormone I give them tells them what they're lacking. Okay? And it also has an effect on their future fertility. Yes? Do you want me to pick? Okay. Yes, yes. You know about polycystic ovarian syndrome? You're right. You can't cure it, but you can treat it. Yeah, and people who have polycystic ovarian syndrome do get pregnant. They're at increased risk for gestational diabetes in pregnancy, increased risk for large babies and uh, complications associated with uh, diabetes in pregnancy. It doesn't have to be. You treat sometimes with um, uh, glyburide, metformin, which are kind of anti-diabetic medications uh, that actually help with their fertility to some extent. Um, it's not a horrible thing, you know, just because your cycles are irregular or you have some of the components. What it means is that you should see the physician you should have a good endocrinologist or a good gynecologist who understands that syndrome, understands what the risk factors are, treats you appropriately and aggressively, and gives you the truth about future fertility. Because it does not mean you cannot get pregnant. That's not true. Remember syndrome. Some people just have menstrual irregularity, maybe a little bit of unwanted hair, not that big a deal. And there are other people who have full blown, they kind of look like a man, right? So it just depends. There are lots of things that are not curable. I would hasten to say that most of the stuff that we do in medicine is probably not curable, treatable, controllable, not necessarily curable. Are those physical symptoms reversible with Obesity? No, the uh, male appearance of the, that I, that's associated with the... Uh, Terminal hair changes? Yeah. You can work on it. The Electrolysis, wax. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can slow down the growth of hair by using hormones that suppress testosterone. Remember I said the birth control pill? So that'll help. Um, but what you have, that's not going away. So the beard or the hairs, you need to pluck those. You need to wax the mustache. Yes. But if you take the birth control pill, you can suppress and slow down the growth. Because, you know, hair takes like three months. I mean, it takes a long time to grow. So you have to take the pill long enough to at least suppress new hair growth. And that's going to take at least three months before you see that. That makes sense? So, yeah, you can, the word reverse, I don't want to, because you have to be careful. You can treat and support, but it takes a lot of work on that patient's behalf. They have to exercise and understand the frustration of not really seeing the, the scale change, but physically feeling a lot better. And their fertility many times comes back. They start having more regular cycles. That's when you really know that things are getting better. Yes? Yes? I didn't know, but I tell people, give me at least 30 days. I say, start off. First of all, I'm going to change their diet, and I'm going to get them to start walking first. If I can get them to do that, and that's tough. I'm changing the diet, and I'm making them exercise. And I've already assessed at least if there's anything I can do about their blood sugars or things like that. If they don't need anything there, then we follow their uh, hemoglobin A1C, and we follow all that other stuff, blood pressures, and we try to change with physical lifestyle change. It's not just me. I get them involved with the health educators so that they have the opportunity to talk to people that have enough time to really talk with them about what diet is, what it means to change the diet. Not just, I want a low-fat diet. I need, you need to add this protein and you need to add this complex carbohydrate and I need you to know that that food is not going to work as well for you. I didn't say you could never have another Krispy Kreme donut. What I said is that you cannot make the bun on your burger and you can't eat it every day on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. It becomes a treat as you incorporate more healthy lifestyle choices because that's the only way you're going to get somebody to change. You tell them that you need to stop eating what you're eating and go run a marathon and you just, you know, you're wasting your time. And sometimes that's what they hear. I know it sounds crazy, but that's what they hear. They're like, this is impossible. I can't do it. Some days you do better than others. 
And other days you say, okay, I'm going to do some more walking today. That's how you change any habit. Good question. Other question? We're good? Yes. Many of the diseases that you discussed and listed uh, <clears throat> emerged, I guess, some are old, but a lot in the last 10 years were um, in your practice. Have you, do you see some new thing coming up in, in women's health that maybe we should be paying attention to studying higher? Anxiety. Anxiety. Mm -hmm. so. Anxiety. Mental illness. We don't talk about it, and that's a big deal with the, the whole thing with the Newtown shooting and mental illness. But mental illness is just as much a part of medicine and just as significant, I think, in its incidence. I could be wrong. I don't think so. I believe that clinical depression and generalized anxiety disorder and bipolar disorder are extremely prevalent. I believe it. And I believe that the ability to diagnose it and treat it appropriately is where we as healthcare providers fall way behind. We are not, I think, actively attracting these young and bright students into psychiatry because it don't pay. People don't want to go into residencies that are not going to be able to pay for their undergrad and medical you know, education. It is a, uh, you got to love it. And your patients, some of them will kill themselves, no matter what you do. Um, sometimes it's a thankless job. We are horribly understaffed with respect to therapists and psychiatrists. And so what happens is that, you know, you've got one therapist or one psychiatrist that's, you know, seeing way more patients than they need to. Um, and it should be a part of our normal curriculum. Why do I say that? We brought up at Kaiser's, big deal. We've got 20 plus clinicians on staff at any one time, 10 to I think 15, either in clinic, on labor and delivery, in the operating room, wherever. And each of us sees on average at least three times a week, 12 to 14 patients in the morning, 12 to 14 patients in the evening. If you're in the OR, you're probably doing at least three or four cases in the OR. If you're in labor and delivery, you may be doing five or six deliveries during that day, but you're on 24 hours, you may do more. So we work pretty hard, almost like residency. But the key is the components of all of the diseases that we see that may have a psychological component is high. We don't recognize, or at least we don't address properly domestic violence. There's a big thing right now about sexual intimidation, which is where Patients who are sexually active with their partner intimately feel coerced into having sex, feel like they can't say no, or if they've ever had sex with this person, they felt intimidated not to say no, or to do something sexually they didn't want to do but felt they had to, or domestic violence where the partner that comes for the new OB visit won't leave the room, and the patient feels uncomfortable with saying that she feels threatened. You know what we do? I'm telling the truth. I see it on the questionnaire and the patient says something. Now I got to ask him to leave. You probably can tell I don't have a problem with that. However, you got to make it tactful enough where he feels like you're not threatening him. She's going to go home with him. So you've got to be able to offer her services or an opportunity where if she feels that she can make the decision maybe to leave or what have you, that she can. She's very vulnerable. Most common time for domestic violence in a relationship is when she's pregnant. That's common. The anxiety, patients who are so obsessed with their vagina. We see it all the time. They got vaginal discharge, but maybe it's not really vaginal discharge. It's that he told her that you smell bad or that you are not beautiful. And for whatever reason, she believed him. And she has pelvic pain when, in fact, there's really nothing going on in the pelvis. This is common. But Western medicine. See disease, write a prescription. Bye. I like a little more holistic Eastern medicine thinking that says that the body as a whole is presenting to you, and it just so happens the symptom is discharge or pelvic pain or headache. But there may be other components. Even in that 15 or 20 minute visit, try to get at the diagnosis as quickly as you can. Manage the expectations of the patient in the sense I'll do my best to get as much information and get the diagnosis. Patient looks acute, treat the patient. 
and make sure you have a connection where you can call back and follow up and see if she's gotten better or if she feels comfortable enough to call you. I think that's what medicine is about. We become very mechanical. I operate on a lot of people. Cut, 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 cut. Taking out a whole lot of uteruses. I don't know how many of those people I probably shouldn't have done that because it made them no better. Only thing I guarantee, they never would bleed again or they certainly weren't gonna get pregnant again, but I didn't fix the problem. So I think that's the difference with medicine, is that we have to recognize that. They pay us a lot of money, I guess, in comparison to the average American, right? But on the same hand, you're gonna work for that every dime. And you're gonna have some days where you're like, what was I thinking? But it's the best job in the whole wide world, I think. Okay. What's that? Oh, we behalf early. of diversity in medicine, we oh. want to give you a small token of our appreciation. Thank you, Thank Angel. you again for your lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you.